Okay, this is the last of our modules where we really have to do something for EDAP 688. Uh, this module is all about universal design for learning. Uh, as you have clearly seen as we've worked through these modules, that there are three modules that represent to my mind the three different ways of looking at integrating technology into uh, your curriculum, into your day-to-day -day teaching. Universal design for learning um, very much pulls a lot of its thinking from the Understanding by Design guys. And I find it to be something near and dear to my heart because I think that it speaks very eloquently to ideas that others have articulated but do not do a very good job of really reaching for an understanding of how it actually gets done. Specifically what I'm talking about is Tomlinson's differentiated instruction. I feel that the understanding by design, as put out by Wiggins and McTighe, and this universal design for learning go so much further in helping a classroom teacher see how they can cope with the extreme diversity of kids in classrooms today. Now, there's, there's some understandings here that, that we have to accept. Um, and, you know, as a K-TIP uh, teacher educator, I spend a lot of time in a lot of schools. So I have a fairly clear picture of what uh, teachers are up against these days. So when I talk about UDL and I talk about use of Edpuzzle and all these other technological things, please understand that I do understand the limitations that you work with them. But it's not always going to be that way. Uh, five years ago, the idea of having um, kids with devices in schools was just starting to take hold, and now it's everywhere. Um, and it, it is a political will now, as much of anything. Uh, the money is certainly there for schools to be given the kind of level of technology integration that this sort of thing that we've been looking at here talks about. So it's not necessarily that we can't do it because we do not have the equipment. The equipment is there. And I don't mean that it's there in your school right now. I mean it can be there. Uh, seeing too many examples, but I also see other examples of a school where uh, a classroom teacher has a set of um, iPads in her classroom, but the charging cords have been stolen. Uh, the iPads are a mess because there isn't a consistent application of standardization of how the iPads will be set up. So you see, it's a political thing. It's a, it's a thing of will. If a district really believes that this is important, it will make sure that it's taken care of. Now, now that I've had my little soapbox, let's look at universal design for learning. UDL is one of those curriculums uh, that took root about 10 years ago. Uh, it comes out of Harvard University. Uh, it has a couple of champions. Uh, the main one is a gentleman by the name of David Rose, uh, who actually runs uh, the CAST. CAST stands for Center for Applied Special Technologies. Uh, and his work is loosely based upon the work here by Howard Gardner. And Howard Gardner's work, I think, has rather 
rapidly slipped into the area of pop culture or pop psychology. Uh, there is a learning styles test here that we put into this uh, module that if you want to take, I, I'd strongly urge you to take it. it. It's fun. But that is not, people seem to equate the two. It has nothing to do with what Dr. Rose talks about in universal design for learning. His work is not based upon uh, some pop psychology. It's based upon real brain scan, looking at how the brain reacts uh, in different situations. And this video, this one, excuse me, this video, which is like, I think it's 45 minutes long, if you are willing to invest the time, and I would urge you to invest the time, this is worth watching because it will fully explain to you the scientific basis for this. And we need to understand that there really is true brain science out there uh, that explains the way that we learn and where the deficiencies in that learning occur. Let me see if I can scan through this a little bit and show you things. Um, Oh, listen to that. He yeah, helped like I did. And it's so interesting, it's so interesting to me um, when he talks about all this that it just makes perfect sense. I, I just can't stress enough to you um, how much I think that all of this, when you look at it through the lens of what we do as teachers, it just makes perfect sense. Now, I'm going to try to pull this in here, and I'm not sure if you're seeing it. And if you're not, I apologize. But think of this as my notes here. Basically, what Dr. Rose has found is that there are three parts to our brain. Now, as he just said in that video, these parts of our brain grow and mature, just as everything else in our body grows and matures. But he believes that there are these three parts in our brain. There's the strategic network, there is the recognition network, and there is the affective network. Recognition network, strategic network, affective network. So recognition network. That's where you store the things that you need to have in your brain that help you understand the world. Simple as that. This round thing that bounces up and down, we call that a ball, if we're English speakers. That's your recognition network. But it goes beyond just simple recognition of apples and oranges, math problems, reading a book, solving an equation. 
because if you do not have within your strategic your recognition network a library of experiences that help you understand the new experiences now uh, psychologists and brain scientists talk about building neural pathways, building neural webs, that every time we learn something new, we build a new neural pathway in our brain. And David talks about that as well. Dr. Rose talks about that as well. But I think to pull back from that sort of hard science, let's put it this way. If you grew up in a very experientially starved home where people didn't read to you. You didn't go on trips to the zoo and have conversations around the dinner table. Your experience base does not prepare you for the rich soup that you walk into in a school building. And by rich soup, I mean all of the things that we have to learn to be successful at school. And not just managing the, the content that someone's trying to put into your head, but managing the, the next piece here, which he calls the strategic network. Strategies for learning. How many times have we struggled with kids who are struggling in our class because, and we kind of lump all this into one big bucket. We call it organization. If he or she would just get organized, if he or she just would understand how to be prepared coming into class. We even have orientation sessions now in high schools where we take ninth graders and we say, hey, welcome to high school. This is how it's going to be. This is what you need to know. Again, if my background is I've never had to experience any kind of strategies or employ any kind of strategies, I don't know how to learn. And so the strategic part of your brain is the how of learning, the planning, the executing, the monitoring. Oh, I'm watching you solve this math problem, and you went step one, step two, step three. I don't even know how to do step one, step two, step three, because I've never had to. And then the last one, and this is, a, this is kind of the hardest one for people to understand, frankly, is the affective network or part of your brain. And this is the why of learning. This is what grabs me, what has gotten me to want to learn whatever it is the teacher is trying to teach me. And once you see this dynamic of these three networks working, it makes all the sense in the world. So if a kid is sitting in your class and they are very poor, and I don't mean social economically. I've known some very, very wealthy kids from very, very wealthy backgrounds who are very experientially poor, who have very few experiences that help them build understandings that they can then build upon to understand new things, if their understandings about how to be organized or how to, to simply do a simple process. You see this quite readily when you sit down with a group of kindergartners and you put a puzzle out. Can we put the puzzle back together? And they struggle because they don't have any experience that had a plan to do the puzzle. And then you teach. Let's look at the parts that have edges. Let's look for colors. Uh, big puzzles, you can look at the outline that it has on the puzzle board. 
And then finally, under the affective, is this exciting? Is this something I want to take on? Is this something that I want to learn? And so any time that those three networks fail, learning does not take place. Now, what David stresses is this idea that children do not fail the curriculum. The curriculum fails children. And there's all kinds of pet uh, phrases and toss-off lines that people who do UDL use a lot. One of those is... Um, we're, we are trying to get to the edges. We're trying to include the edges. Uh, there's a bowling analogy. You bowl toward the gutter. I'd never like that analogy. But it's a, it's a really simple idea when you think about it. Multiple pathways in to understanding with multiple pathways out for demonstration of understanding. Now, if you've been really into this course, and if you paid attention to the guys in the module before this, you just had a light bulb go off. Because what Grant and Jay talk about in Understanding by Design is that all education is understanding that are applied, or in their term, transferred. And those multiple pathways out, those multiple pathways of demonstration, are part of their facets of understanding. And so this is a simple next step. UDL basically is saying, if we give kids multiple pathways in to understandings and we will accept multiple pathways out of demonstration of understanding, then we'll have success. So now I'm going to tell you a story because you know I can't help but tell stories to, I think, illuminate this very nicely. I have a dear, dear friend. Uh, a man who I love more than any person in the world, whose son was born with uh, Down syndrome. And I have known his son since he was born. And one of the things that I have been most proud of is my relationship with these two people. Not because I did any great things, but because I was a friend. And one of the things that this friend and his wife decided very early on is they were not going to allow their son to be placed in special education classes alone. And so through support, he participated fully in the regular curriculum at the elementary, middle and then he went to high school. And the doors started banging shut. How could you do high school work when you have an IQ of two standard deviations below the norm? If you've been taking your stats class and research class, you know what I just meant. He was in an AP history class, American history class. And the teacher said, oh, he's more than welcome to be in here. Uh, he can sit and enjoy being in the class with his uh, classmates. And he can enjoy being a part of what we're doing. But I don't know how he's going to be able to produce the final product for this class, which is a 20-page research paper. Well, my friend was, was, you know, at a loss. 
um, writing was not a strength of his son. He could write, and he could read. But it was not a strength. His son came up with the idea. Just like the young man, if you watch this video, you'll hear Dr. Rose talk about him. And this was his idea. He said to the teacher, he said, so we're supposed to take an aspect of American history from World War I on, no, excuse me, from the turn of the century, in other words, uh, the 20th century, from the turn of the 20th century on, and explain it through the different ways that you're going to teach us. Now, I am almost literally, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm almost literally quoting him. The teacher said, sure. Could you write that? Could I make a video? Could I do it about music, because I love music? Could I explain to you where jazz came from, because I love jazz? The teacher was flabbergasted, and he said, sure, let's do it. And so in that moment, that teacher took a very brave step to step out of what the curriculum dictated and allowed the student to dictate to the curriculum. Did he do as much work as any other student in the room? You betcha. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever sat down. He used a product called iMovie. I don't know if you've ever used iMovie or any video editor. It's not easy. It's hard work, especially when you're trying to piece together all the disparate elements of where did jazz come from. Well, I've got to go find all of these examples of it, even though I've got YouTube. I still have to organize myself and think about all the different parts and put it together into some coherent form. That, my friends, is universal design for learning. And we see it now because it has taken hold in a lot of places. You know, when I go in and, and again, when I go in to observe, I'll see a student who is using a device to put in their thoughts instead of paper pencil. Google, there's an extension in Chrome that allows you to dictate into Google Docs. There's all kinds of tools out there now that literally give us multiple pathways in with multiple pathways out. So that's what I'm saying about universal design for learning and how it fits within this whole concept of this curricular examination of technology integrated into our teaching. I urge you strongly urge you to carve out 45 minutes of your time to sit and watch this really excellent presentation that he does. Um, here's some more examples here on UDL principles and practices. Uh, one of the things, you know, you see, you're, we're really starting to see this nicely in elementary schools where kids are given hands-on activities now. Build things, make things, explain things. But unfortunately, we st at the end of the day, it's still the MPA and the LPA that rule the roost. That must change. That must change. Because if we think about it, all of us, all of us, are mentally challenged at something. As adults, we like to nuance that. And we like to say, well, I can't do that because I was never any good at math. Ha, ha, ha. And we laugh it off. But somehow, we won't allow that kind of room for a child. Now, I'm not saying 
that we go out and look for the kids who can't do math and don't make them do math. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is we need to realize the curriculum is not the answer. Just like Grant said in one of his videos, the textbook is not the curriculum. The textbook is not the curriculum. I'm arguing that the curriculum is just a guide, that we must identify where kids have weaknesses, and if we are good teachers, we don't need a test to tell us that. You could spot it. Because you're a teacher, and by the very nature that you're a teacher, you have the ability for empathy with people. You like being with people. You like the affective nature of your job. You don't want to go off in a corner somewhere and sit and add up numbers. You like working with people. You therefore have an empathy. And you realize what kids need. Now let me go and let's look real fast at what the challenge in this module is. And I, I want to stress this is just a very, very um, small tip of the iceberg. But I, I like Edpuzzle, and I think as a starting point uh, for someone who is just a regular classroom teacher, Edpuzzle makes a lot of sense. Let me stress that I fully understand that you may or may not have the resources for Edpuzzle to be done on a major way. In other words, do you have a room full of Chromebooks? Do you have a room full of iPads? Do each one of your children have a phone? Could you do an Edpuzzle and have it on a computer in your classroom as a workstation? Yeah, of course. Let me show you how it works. Um, and let me explain how I see UDL working through it. So I'm going to come down here to the bottom where it says Edpuzzle Tutorial. Uh, this is the tutorial right here. I didn't put a, a video in this one. Uh, you know what? I will when I get done here. I'm going to go to Edpuzzle. And in Edpuzzle, you're going to log in the same way you've always logged in to all these paid uh, resources. You're going to log in as me. You can create your own Edpuzzle account. And if you really want to explore this and use this, please do. Uh, but if you're going to log in as me, you know the routine. SBSwan02, Louisville.edu. Password U L I T two four one, and it's in the it's in the notes there in the module. We need to go to my content, and we need to let me get this out of the way. There's something here about it has its own curriculum, etc. The thing about Edpuzzle. Here's the thing about Edpuzzle. You can set this up and put your kids in this and so that you can assign them things inside the Edpuzzle because what Edpuzzle allows you to do is create little formative assessments inside of videos from YouTube. Stop and think about that for a second. So we've lifted the level of the sort of bland experience at looking at something to actually giving feedback. It becomes interactive. And it all starts with something as simple as a video. Let me show you one here. I think I think I can show you one. We're drawing nets and using nets. Let me see if this one works.
So this video, someone's using, must be just starting. Okay, I'm going to stop that one because they obviously don't have it set up right. Let's let's just go ahead and we'll start with David. Let's use our one that we made with Dr. Um, Rose. So here's Dr. Rose's presentation, his YouTube video that I just started showing you. And as you can see, I can scrub through it just like you can any YouTube video. But if you look up here, what I have is I have three different buttons. Now let me help you understand what they're for. The first button, you can replace the entire audio track in a video that you have with your voice. So if the content, the visual content is really good, but the audio stinks, you can take all of that out. You can add audio notes. And what that means is as the video is playing, it'll stop when an audio note is present. And it can be your voice saying, okay, what you're getting ready to see here is very, very important. Please take note of the following things. It then will start playing again. And lastly, you can build in little formative assessments. And if you set this up as a class, what the kids do with the formative assessments is given back to you as data. The last thing is you can crop your video. Why don't we start there? Let's see if I can, if it'll let me crop. Uh, as you can see right now, it's kind of just spinning. Let's see if I can discover where that was, where he starts talking about uh, the different parts of the brain. Let's see if we can find that. I'm, I'm scrubbing through right now. And this is the work. Okay, let's go back. Let's keep looking. Ah, here we go. We're getting there. This is really, I just can't stress to you enough how good this video is. It really is. Some of it is getting old. Uh, but that's okay. All right, let me see. There's Vygotsky. Go, Vygotsky. Well, isn't that a great line? We can either dumb the books down or smarten the books up. I think that's a great line. And you know what that means. We can put more ways of understanding into the books than just text. Nothing wrong with text. Nothing wrong with text. But if I struggle with text, there are so many different ways that we have now of helping people achieve. All right. I'm going to go back to here. Yeah. All right. Let me jump back to here. Let's just do this. And I'm going to slide this forward. And all I want is just this much. And now, now I'm going to crop it. Now I'm going to crop it. And now what I've done is I essentially have said, this is all I want out here. Now watch why I go in here and I can add an audio note. So my audio note is right here. And it's waiting for me to record something. As you watch this part of the Rose video, pay particular attention to how he shows you the different parts of the brain and how they react to different kinds of learning. Stop. And now what I've done is I've given myself a little note.
And so what this allows you to do is to have this wonderful ability to drop in and leave a note behind as an organizational tool for your students to understand what's coming next. So you've gone in and you've made decisions that under the recognition part by saying, this is where the stuff is that you really need to know. So I'm going to cut it all down. This is what I really want you to know. And now you've left a note to prepare me, to organize me, to tap into that strategic part of my brain to help me understand how this works. Okay, let's do the last piece here, quizzes. So now I can put in a quiz. And I'm going to let it show you how here real fast. Let's try it. So I'm going to move my little thing down. And I am not going to take the time here. <laughs> I'm not going to take the time here to watch this video real closely so I can see what I'm doing. I'm just going to go ahead and make this. So there I go. Um, I'm going to do an open-ended question. Or can I do a multiple choice question? Or can I allow you to put a comment here? I think we're in we're in comfortable territory here. Um, how does the brain learn? Okay, and down here I can type the answers. I can say through experiences. And I can add more down here, eating Cheerios. I don't know why I put that in there, but there it is. Okay. And you can keep, you can keep adding answers here. Just click down. Lots of sugar. Okay. You get the idea. Now I'm going to save that. So now within this, I have a little quiz that can pop in. And I can, you know, put it wherever I want it to go. So what happens is when it comes up to the video, when the video comes up to where this is on the timeline, it pops in and allows the kids now to interact with you. I'm going to finish, and it says, where do you want this to go? In other words, what class do you want this to uh, be? Notice the one here about skipping. You can put a check mark in there, and people cannot skip through your video. You can also put a due date on it. You know why? You can assign this into an online class that you may have in either in Modo or Schoology. You starting to see it? Now, I'm going to go ahead and say up here that I want to share with anyone. Why am I doing this? Because now I have the ability to either take this link, and this is what you're going to do with it, you're going to take this link and you're going to put it into the live text assignment. In other words, this is your demonstration that you've done this. 
But if you wanted to, you could take that embed code and you could put that into any web-enabled space you own. Wiki Spaces, Schoology, Edmodo, anything that you work with. This Blackboard, <laughs> Lord help you if you have to do that. But now you have a way of taking it out and putting it into your instruction. I find that if I wanted to use this, and, and I know lots of folks who do, that what they do with it is they assign, they go in here and they create a class, and then they assign it. And that way, uh, when you go in to see it, you're logging in to here. And as I said, you can either do that through taking the link and putting it in somewhere, when the kid goes to it, it then asks them to log in. Um, and that way, what it does is it helps you because it collects the data on how they did with the formative assessments that you build into it. Now, that was Edpuzzle. Let me make sure that I show you that if you want to do this, you can go in here as well. And you can look at things that someone's already made. Now let me show you how it works. Watch this. Okay. Now, this video was obviously developed for Edpuzzle, but it gives you a sense of what you could do. So you could have your voice right here talking about what's going on in the video, and then right next to it would be the formative assessment. Just giving you some ideas here. You're going to go in to My Content. You're going to create new. So the first thing you have to do is, of course, have a video ready to go. I understand that when you do that, all you're doing is that you're going into the YouTube land, into the tube of the U, and you are finding a video that makes sense to what you're trying to teach. Be aware that the quality of that video is going to really um, help with the success. Look for videos that allow for those multiple pathways in. Good, clear pictures, good, clear animations. And then you can add your own commentary as little notes, or you can take out the entire audio of the thing and make it your own. You can crop it so that the one minute that's inside that video that makes all the sense in the world out of the seven minutes that it is, or if you're working with students who have a very short attention span, crop it down. Then go back in, set it up with your voice, and then your formative assessment. Okay, doke. That was module number three. We are almost done. In fact, we are done. <laughs> because the next module is module four, which is nothing more than a module of resources for you. And they're all laid out here. By the way, these all come from uh, real live Honest Gosh teachers. And they were just examples that they gave of technology that they have used in their classrooms and that they used in the final assignment here. If you go into the Module 4, uh, there are technology tutorials and manuals, again, for stuff that uh, you have used. And if you've had more than one of these courses, you've used them. 
and then down here is video and presentations on Web 2.0 tools. So as you can see, Module 4 really doesn't have much <laughs> in terms of things you have to do. It's a closet. Thank you. That was the best description. It's a closet. It's a closet full of resources for you. Okay, doke. Uh, if you have any questions, you know how to reach me, 502-457-2937. If you need to come into the office and literally sit side by side and do this together, of course I will do that. I will have this uh, posted come uh, Thursday morning. Thank you all.